Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. Just give everyone a chance to enter the room. So today we're starting a new series of talks on lean in algebraic number theory and arithmetic geometry. And for our first talk in this series, we're very happy to have Alex Best, who's talking about formalization and arithmetic geometry. And Alex, is it all right if we record this talk? Yeah, that's fine by me, thanks. Oh, great. And feel free to ask questions throughout. So um, Alex, yeah, please go ahead. Right, thank you very much for the for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's it's great to have a advantage on this on this topic. Um, I guess Vantage is a series about conjectures, and there maybe won't be as many of those um, today, but there'll be plenty of sort of open questions or, or sort of things to ponder on. So I'm going to try and give quite an overview talk. So I'll be quite general. Um, I'll talk about sort of the, the big picture of this area, um, its relation to arithmetic geometry, and sort of maybe where things are going in the future. So. I will try and be broad. I'm, I'm going to assume basically no background in um, lean or in formalized mathematics, but I, I will, I guess, assume some in arithmetic geometry, um, and we'll use that kind of as a, a common language for, for some of the things we're talking about. And when we're, um, well, when I'm presenting some of these examples, I'll try and pick things which are maybe of interest more to arithmetic geometers. So without further ado, um, what is, well, Lean, what is formalization? So Lean is a computer program. And it's a computer program aimed at sort of doing the following thing, which is expressing mathematics. So this is both mathematical objects, but also mathematical arguments in a format that, it, that it can be handled by this program sort of rigorously in a format that it can be interacted with by a program. So this is different to a computer algebra system, which can maybe represent objects by representing them as a, a finite list of data, in that this can represent arguments. It can check arguments in the same way that a computer algebra system might run a calculation, right? One of these computer programs will allow us um, not only to check if arguments are correct, it will allow us to follow the chains of arguments and it will allow us to understand sort of which objects are being talked about by which other statements, in addition to also being a platform for doing sort of regular computations with these objects. So these are quite um, exciting tools in that they allow not only to do things that we're used to doing with computers with mathematics, but allow us to do uh, a whole lot more. So I think the best thing to see here is, is an example. So this is a real example, right? This is not uh, a small example. We'll come back later to sort of a, a, a good kind of intro example. Um, but this is an example of, of really the state of the art. So this is the polynomial freiman russo conjecture. So this was proved um, this year, or at most one year ago. And this is some code in the system lean that expresses uh, the statement of this conjecture. So we can see here, the language is um, quite formal, but there are some sort of recognizable um, words to a mathematician. So here, for example, we say that G, some, some type, is an additive commutative group, that it's a measurable space, that it's countable. And then we talk about a subset of G, um, and we claim that if the subset is not empty um, and has a certain property, namely that the cardinality of the subset added to itself is at most K times the cardinality of the subset for some K, a real number, then there is some other additive subgroup an element such that, um, sorry, another subset, such that some numerical condition holds. So this, uh, I don't know the details of, this is not necessarily my area, but this was a big result. Um, this was proved by uh, Tao Gowers, um, and I forgot the last name, I, I apologize, uh, this year. And the interesting thing about this result is that it was formalized by a sort of a team of, of 25 people not long after it was proved. So by formalized, I mean, they took the informal statement and the informal proof in pen and paper mathematics or a paper on the archive in this case, and translated it into this language in such a way that the program, lean in this case, can check that the argument holds. So why is this interesting? Well, when I was preparing this slide, 
I copy pasted it. Like I said, I was not really involved in this project. I copy pasted it from somewhere else. And I sort of made a mistake when copy pasting it that I think illustrates um, really the power of this technology. So when I copy pasted this statement and the proof, I kind of took various parts of the file. So these, state, these statements here come from the top of the file. And um, this other part here comes from the bottom of the file. And I pasted them together. And as I was preparing the slide, I thought to myself, do I really need a countable group G here? So this, this um, assumption here that G is countable or, you know, um, not being an expert in this area, I wasn't sure whether I'd got the statement right, but there was a formalized proof. So what I could do is simply delete that line. So here I've changed the assumptions and the program, of course, this is a screenshot of the program, not the program running itself, helpfully informed me, but that by removing these assumptions, um, I still was left with a true statement and a correct proof. So what the, the program enabled me to do is as a novice in this area, to sort of play with the assumptions that I had pasted into this file and to see which ones were necessary for this statement and its proof and which ones were not, right? So of course, like I said, this was a mistake I made when preparing the slide. The actual statement and proof in that project is of course this version without the extraneous assumptions, but the one I originally copy pasted was this one with extraneous assumptions. So I hope this demonstrates the sort of spirit of what I mean by interact with rigorously. It allows us to sort of trace back different parts of the proof, different components, and to see which ones are used in other places to jump to the definitions of the objects involved in the same way that we might jump to the definition of something, you know, or jump to the web page for our, our favorite song or something. We can jump to the definition of our favorite, you know, definition and see how it's stated here. So with that said, this is a, another example of the state of the art in a sense. It's about a much more basic result, but it's written in a much more maybe readable way. So instead of previously where there was uh, maybe more symbols and less English words, this is an example of a simpler result, something about continuity and sequential continuity, um, which is still clearly written in a rigid way, right? It's written somehow formally with a, a structured language and indentation and some brackets around various things, but in a way that's sort of more readable. So I'd like to encourage you to, you know, think more of this when thinking about the future of formalization and less about symbols you know, that, that are sort of less like English. So this is an example from Patrick Masseau's teaching where he teaches lean to first year undergraduates and he uses a system like this, except in French, in order to allow the students to learn both this formal proof and informal proof without sort of having to learn two different dialects of mathematics. So to learn sort of how to write mathematics while also writing it in a formal way, but without learning separately various conventions about funny symbols and only learning sort of st a structured version of the English language. So this is the second example. So why are people interested in these pieces of software? Well, there are many reasons, of course, why people are interested varies from person to person. Um, but here are some things that I find interesting. So the first is that when you have a large amount of mathematics, which is expressed formally, so expressed in a, in a way that the computer can to understand it in some sense, you can quickly search um, rather than searching by, by name or by um, some sort of like snippet of text that you think hopefully captures the thing you're looking for. You can search for a mathematical result by its formal statement in a way that you might find it, even if you have sort of no idea what the terminology involved is, right? When you have a system that understands the logical structure of the mathematics, rather than simply a, a Google search, you unlock a very different type of search for mathematical results um, that may not be possible before. Another thing that you might be doing with such software is if you have a, a large amount of say routine arguments that sort of basically follow the same structure or same principles, um, but where the details sometimes differ. And you want to sort of know that those things are true without maybe checking them all individually by hand. Right? Maybe a, a sequence of arguments that essentially follow by copy pasting 
uh, the first argument and changing some numbers, this is a sort of mathematics that can be easier to deal with when you have uh, one of these pieces of software, sometimes known as a proof assistant, because it allows the computer to worry about the details and inform you when they go wrong, but not bother you when everything succeeds. You can also produce um, documents that are not formatted the same way that we've been doing for hundreds of years with mathematical papers, but which are interactive, which allow the reader of the document to look up the precise definition of an object you're talking about, or to be able to tell halfway through the document what the current assumptions are. Right? I think we've all had this experience where halfway through a paper, we've forgotten what the conventions were in the assumptions section on the first page, and we had to flip back several pages in order to remember you know, that the prime P was not two. So this is something that with a, a proof written with a proof assistant, um, a user can read and always see the context, right? What assumptions are currently in play about the objects because the computer is managing uh, for us uh, the, the, the state of play, so to speak. So we'll see in a moment, I'll give a demo uh, of examples of this. Finally, uh, you could do a similar thing with interactive documents where the, the user chooses, right? The user might say, ah, well, I already understand you know, all of EGA, just show me the stuff that um, isn't there. Or they might say, well, I, I'm relatively new to all this. I want to see the details, um, you know, all the way down to, to the axioms almost, right? But by allowing the content to be rendered based on uh, the user's request rather than fixed ahead of time by the author, there, there may be a different way of, of reading and understanding mathematics possible. So I'd like to say that all these things are maybe not quite possible today, but these are the sort of things that excite people working in this field about this technology. So the obvious uh, use case is, is error-free mathematics. I think that's sort of the, the most obvious one is, of course, if the computer checks the arguments, you have a much higher confidence in it being correct. At this point, the, the only errors that can really remain are errors of definitions, um, maybe not meaning what the user thinks they mean. Uh, we also have a lot of overlap with sort of verified mathematical software. Maybe in the past you've written some code that has had some bugs that have caused your argument not to be sound. This is the sort of thing that can be negated or at least avoided um, by formalizing the software. And formalizing the software, when we're talking about research software, necessarily involves formalizing the underlying mathematics, right? If you want to have um, you know, a piece of code that you've proven correct that computes um, the rank of an elliptic curve, you necessarily have to have proven at some point that the rank is a, a well-defined number, right? You have to have proven the model of A theorem in order to be able to prove that that piece of software is correct. So bug-free mathematical software kind of goes hand in hand with formalization of the arguments itself. Um, another thing is what I kind of talked about on the first slide. If I have a result which is already formalized and I want to tweak it or modify it in some way and see which part of the proof breaks, that's way, way more possible. In fact, only possible, I would say, with software that understands the mathematical argument, right? If I take someone's paper and I cross out, let P be odd on the first line, then I will not have gained anything. But with software like this, if I delete the line, let P be odd, I can see precisely where the condition that P is not two is used. And the final um, potential use case of formalization is, is AI. Um, by formalizing mathematics, you allow yourself to sort of train um, machine learning based tools using um, the formalized mathematics and potentially train systems that can assist us with doing mathematics, right? This is of course, you know, a wide open kind of question whether or not um, machine learning can help mathematicians. I mean, I think it's, it's clear at this point that some mathematicians have been helped by machine learning, but whether they can help mathematicians on a daily basis is very much unknown. And many people, myself included, are interested in exploring these ideas further and sort of pushing these sort of systems um, to see, you know, what sort of use they can be in a mathematician's life, whether they can help us with 
um, you know, very boring arguments, or whether they can help us even with interesting arguments, I think remains to be seen. And the thing I'd like to close with on this sort of motivation slide is that we would like to have all of these things, or many of them as possible, without losing anything, right? I don't want to give up on being able to express my thoughts in a slightly vague way where necessary. And I would like to encourage you to think of this sort of examples I'm going to show you today, not as how these tools must behave, but simply how they behave currently. It would be everyone, I think, preference, even people who sort of believe that mathematics is an entirely formal endeavor, if we could express things the way we express them to other humans and the computer understand and check the details. It's just simply the case that currently computers need a little bit more, you know, um, the details spelt out than, than fellow humans do. So for now, we have to sort of spell out some details that we might never do on paper in order to formalize mathematics. The hope of many people is that in the future, this field of formalization will look a lot more like writing LaTeX and a lot less the way it does now. So with that said, I think we should see a demo of how these tools look in action. And the demo I'm going to give is a very classic uh, demo in this sort of space, which is to prove Euclid's theorem. And I'm going to make use of, of something called MATLAB, which is a library of formalized mathematics that has attracted a large number of users who are mathematicians, right? So professional mathematicians, students uh, in some cases, uh, and interested you know, school children in some cases as well. And these people have collaborated to create a very large library of formalized mathematical results that we can then build on um, in order to formalize new things. So I'm gonna to switch to a demo now, one second. Okay. So I should have prepared this earlier, but I'm gonna open up the proof assistant lean and I'm going to do so in an online uh, interface. And the idea here is just to show you um, that it can, if you know what you're doing, of course, this is what happens when we try and do a demo. Um, that it can be uh, quite simple or at least painless to get started playing around with these sort of things. So right now I'm loading an environment where I can interact with Lean. And in a moment, I'll kind of explain um, how interacting with the software looks. Um, but while we wait, maybe this is a good point for any initial questions. I'll ask a question. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I'm completely sold on the uh, assumptions and dependencies justifications. Those by themselves make me very excited. Um, mm -hmm. I was, but I was curious about the ability to search for, mm -hmm. because this strikes me as potentially an undecidable problem, right? I mean, you've got to somehow match my expression of some formal mathematical statement to some other potential expression and decide when they're actually saying the same thing. Yes. And I'm um, wondering... If you You're absolutely correct. That. I mean, when you say it like that, it, it's it's the, the biggest example of an undecidable problem we have, which is doing mathematics itself, right? You know, you could say that all true statements are equivalent. Therefore, deciding if, you know, the statement you're interested in is equivalent to something else is basically just, you know, the problem of proving mathematical statements, which is undecidable. Um, so yeah, that's very much true. So it's one of those exciting problems, I guess, like many interesting problems that, well, Take, for example, the problem of, you know, rational points or, or integral points in Diophant's and equations, right? It's a problem that we know to be undecidable in general, and yet we hope in sort of certain special cases, and, you know, we have evidence in certain special cases that it is more tractable. Um, you know, when fed maybe a nice example or two, um, the systems may be able to match up um, the thing we we've written down with something that, that's out there on the internet, for example. But yeah, currently you have to write down a statement in quite a precise form that has to quite closely match the thing that exists in order for one of these systems to be able to match them. Um, there are some, some examples of kind of search-like things that are a bit more um, uh, flexible, let's say. And I think the most common example is when you have a result which is stated in, in much more generality than the one you're thinking of. So maybe you write down some result 
um, and you write it down for the real numbers, but it turns out it's true for any um, algebraically closed field. And sorry, not the real, the complex numbers, let's say, for any algebraically closed field. Um, but maybe you don't even know what algebraically closed field means because maybe you've never studied that. Um, so you don't even know what the right word to search for is, right? Why does my polynomial always have a root? That's the sort of thing that right now you could express in a formal statement. I could write down a lean statement saying, I have a complex polynomial. Um, does it have a, like, tell me why it has a root. And one of these systems will be able to prompt me with the, the statement that in any algebraically closed field, any positive degree polynomial has a root. So that's something we could try today. Um, but it's in general, a hard problem. Okay, so. Thank you. I love your answer. Undecidability is a call to arms, not a, not a reason yeah, to give up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, so with apologies for the wait, we should be good to go now. So the first thing I'm doing here is, is I'm importing MATLAB. Um, so like I said before, MATLAB is this large library that contains, for example, the definition of the natural numbers or um, you know, the definition of the factorial function, the definition of prime, various things that we're going to need in this proof. And I'm going to start by writing the statement which I care about, which is for all natural numbers n, and I express that like this, n colon nat, and I think I should make the font maybe a bit bigger, and I should get rid of this guy. Okay. Um, so this is the statement that for all natural numbers something, and I'm going to say there exists some p, which is also a natural number. And the statement I'm trying to prove is Euclid's theorem that there exists infinitely many primes. So I'm going to say that p is bigger than n. And well, in this case, I happen to know already, but the statement I want to make is that nat dot prime p. So I've expressed the statement that I want to prove here. Um, hopefully that sort of looks vaguely reasonable to people as a statement that you might be interested in proving. And hopefully the syntax looks enough like mathematics that it's not too different. Maybe the only weird thing is this nat.prime. So if we're interested in what nat.prime is. We can press the command key on my keyboard and click on it. And we can see the definition. In this case, the definition is a bit, well, maybe vacuous at first sight. It says that something is prime when it's irreducible. And if I hover over irreducible, I can see that something is irreducible if it uh, is a non-unit and factors only into units. So that's the sort of interaction we can have. If we don't know the definition of something, we could hover over it and click on it and kind of see the definitions here. Um, so I'm just going to kind of get started proving this thing. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce my n that I want to prove something about. So I'm just going to focus here on this bottom panel. And in the bottom panel, I've gone from a statement, which is for all n, there exists a p, such that p is prime and p is bigger than n, to the statement that I have a given n in hand. And now I'm trying to prove that there exists a prime p for that particular n. So on paper, this is maybe not a statement we would even um, spell out unless we were teaching you know, very first year undergraduates or something. Um, but in a formal system, this is often the sort of um, manual uh, change you have to be aware of. And well, now I have to think of it, right? I have to prove that there exists some prime number p, which is bigger than n. And the way that we normally do that is we uh, take n factorial and add one. So maybe I'll say let m be n factorial, add one. And I will put something at the top there, which allows me to use the factorial notation. And then I'm going to let p, in this case, be, well, I happen to know the name of this thing, but I want the minimal factor of this m that I've just defined. And it turns out min fac is the name of the function that takes a natural number and gives me the smallest prime factor. So my prime p will be the smallest prime factor in this case. I guess I could have picked any of them, but picking the smallest is easier, of my number m. So, so far, I've started my proof. I've introduced some m that I'm trying to find a, uh, a bigger prime number than. And I take an n factorial, I've added one, and I've taken the smallest prime factor of that. And as we, we know from sort of Euclid's proof, this prime number should be a, a witness of a prime number um, bigger than n, right? That's what we're trying to prove. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, this existential statement, my witness will be this particular p. 
And then now I have to prove that this particular P is bigger than N and that this particular P is prime. Okay, are there any questions so far about sort of how this thing looks or, or kind of what I'm doing here? Because I think it's important that we, we, we get the basics right. What does the by mean at the top? Oh, the by means that I'm about to start a proof. So it means that I've gone um, from the statement and I've gone for a proof in this kind of, um, this language with the introdu introduced n and the lets and the use um, okay. as opposed to a different one. Any other questions at this point? Yeah, I guess the hover is not that useful here, but constructs a term of the expected type by running the tactics. This means that we're going to prove something using tactics, which is what this kind of language is here that I'm writing. Okay. Well, I have to prove an AND statement. Um, and to prove an AND statement, well, of course, what we do is we, well, we prove both sides separately. I mean, that would be the normal thing to do. So um, in this case, well, I could kind of look up what the name of that lemma is. But in this case, um, well, I happen to know what it is. So I'm just going to write apply and dot intro. So this and dot intro here is the statement. That if I have a proof of A and a proof of B, then I get a proof of A and B. And once again, this is kind of a tautology. Um, but what this does when I apply it is it produces me now a state where I have two goals. The first is to prove that P is bigger than N. And the second is to prove that P is prime. So logically, this is a course equivalent to what we just did before, but we see already how the system is keeping track of what remains to be proved at each point. So it's, it's changed a, a proof of one thing into two separate proofs, and it's going to keep track of each of them separately. We sort of duplicated our state. So the way that we lay this out normally is we put some bullet points to kind of separate the two halves of our proof. Um, So in the first one here, I put a bullet point and I've written the word sorry. And sorry means I'm not filling in the proof right now. Please wait. And I have to prove that P is bigger than N. And in the second one, I have to prove that P is prime. So of these two, I think the second one is slightly easier. So I'll do that first. So, well, why is P prime? Well, P was chosen to be the minimal factor of, of M. And well, the minimal factor, um, is defined to be the smallest prime factor of, of n when n is not one. So this should basically be sort of true by definition. So I'm going to write exact question mark, which is a way of saying, I believe that this statement that I'm now trying to prove is a lemma in the library. Please go and look for it. And of course it fails um, because I should have written apply question mark, which is this statement that I'm looking for, I believe that it will be in the library somewhere um, maybe not exactly, but with some sort of side assumptions. And in this case, the first thing it suggests to me, you see there's this panel down here called suggestions now, is try this, it gives me some statement, and it says remaining sub-goals is to prove that M is not one. And of course, yeah, if we're taking the minimal factor of some number, we want it to be prime, then the input number should probably not have been one to begin with, because one, of course, doesn't have any prime factors. So you see already, this is how the system will kind of remind you of little kind of annoying side conditions that you may have forgotten, right? Now I have to prove that M is not one. Well, maybe in this case, I'll just kind of go a bit quicker, but um, I'm going to say maybe, okay, unfold the definition of N, of M, sorry, and now I have to prove that N factorial is not one. And to prove that a factorial, sorry, it's not zero. Um, so this already did kind of a couple of steps for me in kind of one go, I went from M is not one n factorial is not zero and n factorial not being zero well n factorial is never zero so this is a case where hopefully i will put exact question mark and it will tell me yes indeed this is a statement which is already in the library it's called in this case factorial not equal to zero which is a, a great name for such a fact and that's the end of of the the first sorry right so here i could write the word done which will give me an error if i'm not done um, but when I am done, done will happily say, yes, you are done. Okay, so this is a kind of a way of laying out the proofs um, just to be kind of clear what's going on at each point. So any questions about that? We've completed the proof now that um, P was prime by saying, well, the minimal factor of a number is going to be prime unless that number is one. 
Okay, in this case, if the number was one, that meant the n factorial was zero. And we know that n factorial is never zero. That was the proof we just expressed in three lines here. I have a quick question. Um, yeah. so, so is unique factorization of the integers already sort of incorporated into lean? Yes, uh, that will be somewhere in the MATLAB library. Um, it will probably have some sort of un, unintuitive name, like the integers are a unique factorization monoid or something like that, but that will be in there somewhere, yeah. Well, there's also a question, um, I can read it if David doesn't want to, um, about how minfac is implemented. Usually that takes time. Yeah, so, I mean, this library is very large. People have worked on it now for maybe five years. So it contains many things. And um, in this case, we can see the implementation here if we keep clicking on stuff, uh, I guess. I can't really read it. I don't know about you. Um, so I don't know kind of how it's implemented. I mean, it will be here somewhere in this file, mathlib data nat prime. Um, and we can see here people proving the basic properties of it, things like the min factor, minimal factor of n divides n, and the, the fact we just used that it's prime. Um, but somewhere in here will be the definition. But uh, I think maybe more important than the definitions most times is the properties. Sort of, we can give equivalent definitions of, of things, um, but more important is the properties. So, oh, it looks like this is the definition. Okay. It searches up to the square root by the looks of things. And then if you find something that divides it, then you return that thing. So it's kind of implemented the way you might expect in a programming language. Um, but of course, along the way, we have to prove various things to be sure that we're actually always going to find some things. We have to prove that this bound of uh, square root k suffices and stuff like that. I, hope that I also have a more philosophical question. Yeah. So usually when I prove this statement in an undergraduate class, I do it as a proof by contradiction, where you assume mm -hmm. there's only a finite number of sets. and this proof is in some ways more explicit in that it would actually, if one could factor numbers quickly, it would tell you how to find this prime. And do you see that sort of shift away from proofs by contradiction towards more explicit constructions of proofs being a direction that people are moving with lean? No, I would say not, not really. I think it, this was just for the purposes of the demo. I feel like this one is a little bit more explicit and it's good for a demo, but I think in general, maybe it's even, even the opposite thing. Uh, is is true that sort of people using lean are kind of quite quite happy to do proofs by contradiction. Sort of proofs by contradiction sometimes are somehow easier to to express still sometimes. So I would say I would say not not really. It's just I picked this one for the demo. Uh, okay. The other one would have probably been a little bit less obvious as a newcomer. Right. Right. Thank you. Yep. Um. So. I think I will kind of pause the demo here. I, I won't finish the proof. If you're curious, I will I will show the, the rest kind of later, but we can kind of imagine how it will go. Maybe we'll do some, some simp with our definition P and that will kind of give us something to prove and we'll kind of run um, the kind of search things again. Um, but, um, I think I will switch back to the slides unless there's anything anyone still finds confusing about kind of how this interaction with the system goes. Could I just ask a question here? Yeah. This is sort of um, keying off of your response about how MinFax is implemented. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, this is sort of uh, a soft question or sort of more based on your personal experience, but like you could worry that uh, one of the risks of widespread adoption of like lean or something like a formal proof environment is that people become much more comfortable black boxing. And when someone says, okay, but what's really going on there? They would just say, okay, I don't know. And like, that's sort of fine in terms of like verification. But if you look on like long spans of like mathematical development, there are periodic major gains when people are like, ugh, all that like framework that we've been carrying around for decades is like completely too unwieldy. And we have to rebuild it from scratch in a simpler, more conceptually satisfying thing so that the system doesn't collapse under its own weight. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I wonder to the extent this is, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure this is like answerable, but like if you make the system much more internally self-supported without people really grokking it, you remove a pressure for conceptual development over the long term. Like, is that something that anybody in the community is experiencing in some soft way of like, do you find yourself much more comfortable black boxing things than you were when you were not formalizing? Like, um, do you have less pressure yeah. to really understand or how to rephrase things in conceptual, in, in sort of conceptual ways? I think, um... Certainly, 
I, I don't necessarily find that I'm more comfortable black boxing things. I mean, I guess I always assumed that the things that I black box were true anyway. Um, so whether I refer to them by saying, oh, it's a theorem, I, I found someone referenced in someone else's paper dating back to the 80s, so I'm sure it's true. And whether I say, oh, this is a theorem that apply question mark found for me. I mean, personally, I don't feel like a, a difference between those. Um, and I think one interesting aspect a pressure, so to speak, to refactor things and to kind of find better conceptual um, explanations is the fact that formalization takes time and that rechecking proofs takes time. Okay. So I think that actually does exert quite a lot of pressure towards, um, you know, finding, you know, clean generalizations and kind of not repeating work that I think does maybe encourage this kind of like large scale, like, okay, let's take a step back and kind of see whether we're really doing things the right way sort of thing. Um, I don't know. I think it's personal for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But that's interesting that like compute cost becomes a source of pressure in exactly. a way that yeah. uh, I have no idea how to teach this to students in finite time has previously yeah. been a very generative source of pressure. Mm. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so this leads us actually very nicely onto some recent high profile examples of mathematical formalization projects. So um, the example from the first slide um, took three weeks for a team of a relatively large team, 25 people, um, some of them quite experienced, some of them not so experienced. Um, and you could think of this as analogous to you know, a long reading group or, or kind of a summer school where you know, a group of experts come together uh, experts and students and kind of study a proof for a couple of weeks and each give talks on it and maybe each person gives a talk on a on a separate part of the paper and by the end they've you know at least developed an understanding of the part they were talking about quite well and developed a better understanding of the other parts quite well I think this is reaching the point at least in this kind of area of mathematics of being quite quite similar in terms of effort invested of the participants um, to kind of like an extended reading group or something like that, which is very, very exciting. Um, and obviously some of the features of this are particular to the area of mathematics being talked about. And some of them are particular to the interest of the people involved pushing the, the project forward. So a very different example that didn't take three weeks um, was uh, so the so-called liquid tensor experiment, which was some mathematics that Peter Schultz has developed with Dustin Clausen that he was sort of, moderately uneasy about, and he challenged the formalization community to, to provide a formal proof. And this was a project that once again took about 25 people and took this time a year and a half to get fully complete, and uh, spearheaded by Johan Koblen and Topaz. But what's very interesting about this is that this did lead to a significant refactoring per se um, of a part of the proof um, because of the this, this serious difficulty of having to formalize um, a part of the argument um, led to a part of the argument being extracted out and sort of um, eventually discovered that it, it could be sort of replaced by a far simpler construction. So somehow this pressure of, of needing to spell out all the details encouraged the mathematicians involved to think a bit deeper on what was actually necessary to complete the proof and to find a better abstraction and a better construction um, for this part of the proof. So we can go into details later if anyone's interested. Um, Let's, let's move on to some other examples. Um, so in the area of kind of additive combinatorics, um, people are kind of getting to the point where they formalize things almost in real time. You know, a paper is announced in June and in October they finish the formalization. I mean, there's really a lot of kind of exciting progress there. Um, it's not just kind of algebraic things that get formalized. People have formalized um, Gromov's H principle and sphere version, um, some kind of, uh, I don't know, geometric topology type stuff. Um, the definition of a perfect void space was formalized, and the Kepler conjecture was one of the earliest examples of a formal proof being completed by a large team. So I think we're seeing here a kind of a trend towards larger kind of collaborative projects, which is one of the benefits of this sort of software. People can distribute work and kind of understand, say, I'm going to prove this lemma and I'm going to prove this lemma, and then we can read each other's code when we're done as much as we're interested, but we can be sure that we both use the same definitions and collectively we've proved a big result, which is an interesting kind of dynamic when it comes to um, you know the way mathematicians can sort of distribute large projects in a way that that maybe wasn't really possible before. Um, so I'm going to move on to uh, 
yeah, some examples with arithmetic geometry, maybe particularly, and kind of talk about the state of play when it comes to number theory and algebraic geometry in a little bit. Um, but I'll just summarize by kind of saying that there's strong evidence at this point due to projects like the ones I mentioned, that most mathematics can be formalized with enough effort. And the question now is sort of, you know, can we find abstractions? Can we make these tools better to the point where the effort is once again, similar to the effort of getting your LaTeX compiling uh, and sort of right now it's a factor of maybe five to 10 more to get a, a working lean proof to, when it comes to comparing to your own understanding. And the challenge is sort of to get rid of the tedious parts of this process to the point where, you know, an interested user can formalize something without, you know, excessive extra effort. So sort of the standard undergraduate curriculum is, is pretty much kind of formalized um, where standard here means the French one, because the French have a really rigorous definition of what an undergraduate curriculum in mathematics is. And we're kind of interested now in kind of pushing these things towards more research level topics, arguments which are higher level, maybe less obviously kind of formal, um, or where they involve maybe a lot of very technical arguments that is sort of like, you know, obviously going to present a barrier when you have to spell out all the details. So the question really becomes, can most areas of mathematics be conveniently expressed with such an assistant? And that's what people kind of researching this area are really trying to answer. What are the abstractions in this particular sub area that make formalizing it more convenient? So arithmetic geometry, particularly, I would say sometimes feels less well-developed than some other fields. Certainly, it's not the case that a high profile result um, in arithmetic geometry could be formalized three weeks after the fact, or after it was proved by a team of 25 people. And why is this true? Well, one thing is that sort of maybe slightly infamously, the area takes tools from other areas of mathematics um, wherever possible and makes use of a large range of kind of different, different ideas. So we're talking things like scheme theory and cohomology theory, which are famously you know, rather technical. And these are kind of used every, every day by many arithmetic geometrists without thinking. And this is the sort of thing that is, is quite worrying when it comes to formalizing, right? You know, if you had to start by formalizing, um, you know, several textbooks on homology algebra before you could get to formalizing your own research, you're probably not going to invest the effort in, in using one of these tools, at least not um, for your own research. Um, another reason is maybe social reasons. People interested kind of uh, ended up working on things like this liquid tensor experiment, which are of course fascinating, but maybe um, don't actually, you know, help with sort of um, every arithmetic geometer's work day. And yeah, maybe it's just not true. Maybe this is just a feeling I have that, that isn't true. So in terms of formalized arithmetic geometry, what, what's out there? Um, so I'm kind of summarizing the state of play um, in this kind of math lib library that I've kind of um, given a small demo of and kind of surrounding projects that people worked on. So there's sort of theories of local and global fields. There's, you know, the basics of algebraic number theory. People have formalized the finiteness of the class group with a nice argument that sort of works well in positive characteristic um, as well as for number fields. Uh, there's three shades unit theorem, Kumadedekin. So the kind of the main theorems you might say of a first course in algebraic number theory. There's various types of um, you know, Galois theory and the theory of the absolute Galois group as a topological group. There's Adels and Adels, there's VIP vectors, uh, various people have been working on an L series and modular forms, some piadic L functions. And um, even last week at a workshop introducing sort of mathematicians to this software, um, a group proved Ostrowski's theorem for the rational numbers that there is only the, the obvious absolute values on the rational numbers. Um, so I think this has been done before, but uh, it's kind of an interesting case study that a group of relative newcomers to using this software um, in five days at CERM um, could, could prove this theorem with help from some experts. So uh, this is the sort of you know, rate at which newcomers can make progress if they come maybe to a workshop and have the ability to talk to some experts. Some people are interested in um, defining Fontaine's period rings, and they've sort of defined Divided the power structures. Um, there's a definition of schemes and of elliptic curves and the group law in all characteristics. And this is, there's so much here that I, I you know, I, I can't name everyone, but I put some names at the bottom of some kind of key players in this sort of thing. 
And so this is just to give you a kind of a sense of, of you know, where, where we're at, you know, that there are some very interesting topics, but you could say that we're, we're still quite a long way from research level. You know, a lot of the groundwork is there, but a lot of kind of obvious tools you might want if you were going to sort of formalize, um, you know, research level arithmetic geometry are, are still missing. So there's lots to do. Um, so this was kind of the past and the present. And I'd like to switch to the, the future section and, and talk, maybe I don't want to spoil the rest of the seminar series because we have several kind of interesting speakers who are gonna present presumably on their, their interesting work. But I just want to kind of say, you know, there is now started a project to formalize the prime number theorem and various kind of related results such as Shevatar of density theorem and, and Dirichlet's theorem on prime metric progressions. And like, personally, I, I see Shevatar of density is actually like a, a kind of a key cornerstone result and a lot of kind of proofs in, in arithmetic geometry that involve, you know, checking things for, for various densities of primes and kind of maybe identifying Galois groups based on, on prime splittings and stuff like that. So I, I think, you know, things like Shevatar of density theorem being formalized actually allow a lot of uh, interesting, you know, new results to be formalized after that. So I'm very excited to see progress there. And hopefully we'll, we'll hear more from, from either Mikhail Stoll or Hans Kontorovich later in the sem seminar. Um, so that's that's future. Um, and Kevin Buzzard, also speaking in the seminar, is now starting a, a long-term project to, to formalize the mathematics around sort of modularity leading to a proof of Fermat's last theorem. So this is a, a many year project that he's beginning. And I guess he will tell us a lot more about, but this is the sort of, um, thing that people are now starting to, to tackle. Um, you know, it's an ambitious project for sure. It's gonna take probably a long time because there's a significant amount of very hard but interesting mathematics that would need to be expressed in the system in order to do that. But it's it's kind of exciting, right? It's, it's presumably the sort of mathematics that will, when formalized, allow a lot of different things um, to be expressed. Okay. Um, so I guess, I'm not sure how long I should speak for. I guess I have like 10 minutes left. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. So, uh, are, th are there any questions at this point? Maybe before we move on. Okay. So I'd like to speak about a couple of projects that I worked on. Um, Partly because they, you know, my background is in arithmetic geometry before I, you know, started working on the, all this stuff. And, you know, I, I am interested in, in seeing arithmetic geometry um, expressed in these systems, not because I think it's more important than other areas of mathematics, but simply because it's something that I'm familiar with and I, I like, and it makes sense to kind of work on that. So a lot of the things I've done in the past couple of years have been around, you know, getting some of the, the basics of, of arithmetic geometry, you could say, or maybe just algebraic number theory um, into the proof assistant lean and into the library math lean. So I'm gonna give kind of a, a brief description of, of some of the projects. Um, and I'll try and focus on, on the lessons learned from like a very general perspective and, and not really go too much into the details. Um, so with a few co-authors, you know, Chris Buckbeck, Ricardo Brasca, Eric Rodriguez and Andrew Yang, we, we formalized um, a piece of, classic, classic number theory, like number theory's greatest hits, right? The proof of Fermat's last theorem for regular primes due to coma. So this sort of is, is the, you know, a regular prime to remind you is, is a prime such that um, P does not divide the class number of the P six atomic field. And this was a, a kind of a, a proof that basically spurred the development of the whole theory of ideals of algebraic number theory and so kind of formalizing it is, I would say, kind of an interesting benchmark in whether we, we can express these ideas um, conveniently, right? It's, it's sometimes not enough just to say like, oh, I've got a theorem, you know, that says the class group is finite, you might also want to actually use it. So this was the, the goal. And um, this project, I think it took about a year, you know, we weren't sort of all full or maybe even two, we weren't working on it all full time and we were collaborating kind of remotely. And um, yeah, we finished the project, I guess, at the end of last year. Um, so we have a formalized proof of this uh, result, the Fermat's theorem for regular prime exponents is true. 
And I think the main or one of the main takeaways was that it pays to take time to find the right proof and to find a good proof. So we spent a long time um, thinking that there's a, an important lemma called Kummer's lemma, which is as follows, which is that P is a regular prime and U is a unit in the P-cyclotomic field or in its ring of integers. And if U is congruent to an integer mod P, then there exists some other unit such that U is a P power of V. So this is a lemma due to Kummer. And when you look this up, you know, most people prove this by using class field theory. And we kind of looked at this and kind of despaired thinking class field theory is such a big and important thing, but it, it's it's such a, a lot to kind of formalize, right? There's, there's a lot of material there, right? And um, we weren't sure really whether we'd be able to do it. And by kind of searching around again, this kind of pressure of not wanting to spend, you know, too much time on this project, um, we found that actually there is a different proof. A, relatively less well-known proof, I would say, at least none of us knew it, um, in the exercises of a book by Swinnerton Entire, making use of something called Hilbert's Theorem 92, which I, I put there on the slide for you, if, if you're curious. Um, but the, the sort of the point is, you know, even though you might think you understand the mathematics well, and I think we all thought we understood the mathematics on this project well, um, formalizing it kind of forces you to explore in a kind of a detailed way that, that maybe you wouldn't have previously. And in this case, it forced us to, to kind of seek, you know, alternative ways of proving a key lemma. And we all kind of learned about this Hilbert's theorem 92, kind of a converse to Hilbert's theorem 90 um, by working on this project. So that was kind of a, a fun outcome for us. So if you're curious about this, this proof and how it fits in, um, you can visit that link there and you will see a kind of an outline of the whole proof. So that, that was one lesson. And the other main lesson, which I think people working in formalization are quite well aware of, um, but is kind of maybe interesting to, to outsiders, is we deal a lot with cyclotomic fields and cyclotomic rings. And, you know, on paper, you might say, oh, the cyclotomic field is, you know, the field, the subfield of the complex numbers generated by e to the 2 pi i over n. Right? That's the n cyclotomic field. Or you might say it's the field q adjoint x mod out by the and cyclotomic polynomial. And you would kind of happily pass between these two representations of the same thing. And on paper, that, that doesn't really bother you so much. When formalizing it, it can be a bother. And the solution is almost always to, to abstract, right? And so rather than making a proof like this over you know, a subfield of the complex numbers or of a number field represented as a quotient of a polynomial ring, you abstract to a more general notion of something being a cyclotomic field, you know, what, what kind of, it kind of forces you to think more about universal properties and less about explicit objects, if that makes sense. So in doing this project, we, we naturally were led to kind of set up a universal property for what it means to be a cyclotomic field and prove everything in terms of that until we, at the very end, needed an example in order to actually apply the theorems. So this, this is a kind of a general technique that, that you often come across when formalizing. Um, so I would say, you know, one of the most, um, yeah, I, arithmetic geometry means different things to different people, but, you know, I, I come from a rational points kind of, um, land of arithmetic geometry. And so, you know, to me, um, solving Diophantine equations is what I did in my PhD thesis. And so I'm naturally interested in, you know, to what extent can we solve Diophantine equations and express the proofs in a proof system? And as far as I know, um, this has only been considered from the kind of the very basic kind of local obstructions to Diophantine equations or local obstructions to integral or rational points of curves perspective until last year, um, where we wanted to try and do some, some kind of classic examples. So finding integral points on elliptic curves. So the nature of these proofs, I, I wrote model style descent is similar to maybe this Fermat's last theorem thing where you um, factor the equation over a small number field, and you make some argument about factorization of ideals um, looking a certain way based on a class group, and then you use that to derive, um, you know, in this case, I think there's no, no solutions for the first one and, and two solutions for the second one or something like that. Um, and so this requires working very explicitly with um, number fields and with class groups. And this is something that even though people that define number fields and class groups and proof assistance, people hadn't really tried to work with explicit examples. 
So maybe the kind of the lessons learned from, from this project is that often when formalizing, theory is kind of easier than calculation. And when calculating on paper, we implicitly make a lot of things, we kind of normalize things in our heads. And things which are obvious to us are really because we kind of always write things down in a certain way, right? We always write polynomials, you know, in either ascending or descending order of the exponent. We don't just write them down randomly. And that means when we look at a polynomial, we can always tell what the degree of the polynomial is. Or we can always tell when two number field elements are equal because we always write them down on a nice basis. And this is the sort of thing that you don't get for free when you formalize, right? You have to teach the system, okay, I always want to put my number field elements in terms of a nice basis, and then have to teach the system, okay, now you can really see when two of them are equal or not. So I won't go too much into detail there, but this is the sort of lesson you, you learn about yourself to some extent, is why are things obvious to me as a user, like a, sorry, as a mathematician, and not to the, to the proof system. And quite often there's an algorithm there or some kind of abstraction that kind of makes, makes things clearer. So also, you know, proving things a positive characteristic was the sort of thing we had to do that we had to sort of implement as part of this project. So um, another thing I think is interesting about this, this project was, you know, there are a lot of things that we might use computer algebra systems for. And, you know, by default, one of these proof systems will not have the years of development that have gone into computer algebra systems. And I think if you want to do this sort of work in a proof assistant uh, in the future, we're going to have to sort of either find better ways of certifying results from computer algebra systems or start just saying that we, we trust the output of various computer algebra systems because that's the sort of thing that we tend to use without thinking, right? We tend to use, maybe we look at the LMFTB or something like that, and we just assume that the things there are correct as written. And from the formalization perspective, this requires a bit more work. Um, so I'm kind of low on time, so I'm just going to kind of skip ahead of this. And I'm going to thank you for listening and conclude with the following statement, which is that formalization of mathematics, including arithmetic geometry, is, is quite often slow and painful. You'll realize this if you try it. Um, but we sort of have several thousands of years of like mathematics itself and of teaching it to other humans to catch up on that we, you know, we can't expect sort of to start teaching these things to a computer and sort of to be as good immediately as we are teaching other humans. But we, you know, myself and many other people find it interesting to try. And I think we, we are making interesting progress and it can be a lot of fun. So if you thought this sounded vaguely interesting, I encourage you to visit the following links where you can learn more. And I thank uh, Drew and Rachel again for the invitation. I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Alex. Well, are there any questions? I guess I had a, a question. Yes. Um, yeah, so yeah, thanks for the talk. It was really, really interesting to hear more about this. Um, one thing I was interested in is this, like um, MathLib, which as far as I understand it is sort of like a big you know, pile of all the mathematics that's been formalized in Lean so far. Basically, yeah. And sort of, you know, how are the decisions made about what goes into that? So for example, like, it seems that a lot of the uh, things that actually one gets out of this is like getting the sort of the quote unquote right definitions for things. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like at a lot of research level mathematics, sometimes the definitions are like diff slightly different in different papers and people are sort of footling yeah. around trying to find the right definition. So like, how would it, how did it be you know, decided? I guess just to give one example, um, the, definition yeah. of, the definition of prime that you appeared when you did your demo is not the definition yeah. I learned during my undergrad actually. <laughs> sure. Um, I think, well, there's, there's two things. There's, one thing is when definitions are equivalent, um, but different, in which case I think the answer is always, you know, we want all the possible interesting, um, you know, way, you know, ways of saying this is theorems, you know, equivalent characterizations um, that, that we can use and then people can use whichever one they prefer. Um, but yeah, when there's genuine differences, I mean, it, it does tend to come down to a sort of a community um, vote, a sort of democratic process. I think in general, the thing which sort of wins arguments is, you know, 
a definition that sort of um, allows you to get more things for free tends to sort of win. I think mm-hmm. the classic example with this is, you know, do you allow fields to be dedicated domains, right? This is the sort of like question of like, uh, are zero dimensional schemes at most one dimensional? I mean, they are, but in this sort of thing um, where I think the, the kind of compelling argument there is, well, if we allow them, then we get some results which are useful about fields for free and we kind of have to repeat ourselves less. So I think this is often a kind of a guiding principle of, you know, which definition is more convenient for future formalizations. Um, but you're right, there are sometimes differences and sometimes reasonable people disagree. And then it's like any any human process, I guess. There's a team of maybe 20 volunteer maintainers. And in the end, I guess that their, their, their word um, wins. Um, but, you know, they're, they're reasonable people who can be persuaded sometimes and who also change their minds. It, it very often happens that people add something and then they themselves come along half a year later and they say, this is the wrong definition. We should change to this, this other better definition. I mean, this happens surprisingly often. And I think the the thing I said at the start is the 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 convenience is the the compelling argument. And quite often when you define something for the first time, you give what you think is a good definition. And only after trying to use it do you realize what the you know the most useful version of the definition is. Okay, so, so math math is quite flexible to actually changing definitions and then I guess changing all the proofs upstream that need to be changed. Right, exactly. So this is this kind of thing again of you know you want to have a nice um, interface for your for your your mathematics um, in a way that you shouldn't rely too much on what the explicit definition is. You should have a theorem that says you know bloody bloody blah, blah, blah you know of this whatever. Think this this case of of. of natural number being prime, right? You should have a theorem which says, if you have a prime natural number, then it's irreducible. And you should have a theorem which says, whatever the other characterization would it, I guess you would call it prime, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Give you an example. Um, and then you would ideally use those theorems. And then if someone changed the definition later, then it wouldn't matter to you because you were still using true theorems um, the whole mm-hmm. time. So there's a kind of a, you know, an, an interface, so to speak. So I had a question about modularity and re- modularity in the CS sense, not the number theory sense. Uh, yeah. And runtime. So you mentioned uh, kind of uh, lean taking a while to load, and and you can see that you're getting more and more files as Mathlib grows. Um, mm-hmm. Has the community thought much about how to structure things so that like when you load the library, you're able to uh, kind of actually do that in a reasonable time? I mean, as the as the scope increases. Uh, the mm-hmm. complexity figure. Yeah, um, I guess I would say yes. The community has put quite a lot of thought into such things. And, you know, a fair amount of effort um, does go into making sure that things kind of depend reasonably on each other. I think at one point, I can't remember exactly the example, something like the definition of the class group depended on, you know, a bunch of real analysis that it, it really didn't need to, but it somehow... In order to prove finiteness of the class group, you needed some property of the absolute value function that was proved in terms of some property of some other function that, you know, people people do regularly kind of look at this sort of thing and kind of say, hey, okay, well, you know, this whole chunk of the library morally shouldn't depend on X, Y, Z. So we're going to, you know, refactor things to kind of make sure that's the case. Um, yeah, right now, Mathlib is one large blob, but there are kind of within that different organizational structures you know different files um right now the system is coping well uh i don't know if you've noticed but in the example i did i typed import mathlib and it took like five seconds and so that was importing i think over four thousand files with with over two hundred thousand um theorems and when i was doing the searches to find the results i wanted um that was searching all of it i was searching the entirety of mathlib so right now i think the the you know people writing the system are winning there's kind of always a, a battle right the people using the system push it to its limits and then the people writing the system improve the system i think the people writing the system are winning and that we can we can basically just import everything and it, it works okay on a reasonable computer yeah so i have a question about um so your proof of from us last theorem in the regular case uh, mm-hmm. what what did publication of that look like and how do you imagine that um 
helping or hurting a you know somebody who's trying to get tenure at a, a school yeah that's a great question um the publication well we did it in two parts i mean the proof actually naturally breaks down into two parts case one and case two depending on whether p divides xyz um and the first half we finished before the second half because it didn't require this kumas lemma and that we wrote up as a short paper, I think five pages. And it went to a, a conference called Interactive Theorem Proving, which is a kind of a CS style. It's a conference. Um, but that, um, I think that, that was good. It was a good result for us. I think, you know, we wrote like an interesting paper with a couple of lessons learned from this project. And I think it provided something useful for people to read. Um, hopefully we'll write up the second half. Um, but I think it's it's clear that this is still like an open question. Like, to what extent the sort of formalization kind of projects that people work on are, are considered as like a real mathematical project is maybe a little bit up in the air. I think there's a lot of interest in the area at the moment. And I think at the moment, you know, several institutions and universities are explicitly hiring people um, working on this sort of thing. Um, but that, of course, may change in future. Um, so I think right now, I think there's enough interest in the area that it's maybe not necessarily hurting people's chances to, to sort of take a, a small interest. Of course, if someone spends their whole life doing this and not doing any sort of mathematical research, then I think they will likely have a hard time finding a tenured job at the moment. Um, but certainly sort of doing a few projects on the side I, doesn't seem to have hurt anyone that I know of. There has recently been announced a new journal called the Archive... No, no, the annals, the annals, sorry, of um, formalized mathematics or the annals of formalized proofs. Um, that was announced, I think, about a month ago. And as it's a new venue, I think it remains to be seen, you know, how widely respected it will be in the mathematical community. But I think the people interested in formalization have been sort of crying out for a place to publish that is maybe more like a normal mathematical journal and less like a computer science conference proceedings for some time. And so I hope this will be a a positive change to the landscape. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, are there other questions? I, I had a question. Um, I guess it's along the lines of previous to last question. Um, surprising how uh, fast um, these algorithms uh, are working, uh, working and, 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 and I, I guess that's the reason why it's developed on C++. Um, I always assumed that uh, formalized mathematics was going to go along the lines of Haskell, like type uh, uh, lambda, lambda calculus. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess the question I had is like, what made uh, uh, C++ or I mean Lean uh, be the, which what I'm assuming to be the winner in the in this in this field. Yeah. Okay, so there's a few things to say. So first of all, the latest version of Lean is actually written primarily, I think 90% of it is written in Lean itself, which is kind of a, a I mean, you could say it's a strange thing to do, but, uh, you know, it's self-hosting. So it compiles itself from its own previous version. Um, and Lean is basically um, using type theory. It's using Lambda calculus. So I didn't really show much of the underlying logic here because I think sort of one of the, maybe one of, almost like a, a goal of a good system is that you shouldn't have to worry too much about what the underlying logic is if you only care about doing the mathematics, but it is type theory and it is, you know, quite uh, uh, pleasant actually to work in the type theory. I mean, there's, there's of course debates amongst proponents of different types of type theory or, or different types of formalization. Um, so it's, it's maybe not like a completely clear thing that, you know, type theory is better than, you know, set theory based um, systems. Uh, but the reason that Lean has developed the way it has and become sort of uh, had a large following amongst mathematicians, as far as I can tell, is, is mostly just sort of social. You know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, of course, a few design decisions were made that made it appealing towards mathematicians, you know, things like using LaTeX based kind of Unicode symbols to kind of make it look a bit more um, like a mathematical paper might, um, but, but as far as I can tell, you know, it's sort of a, a social rather than a technical uh, phenomenon uh, for why Lean is, is kind of winning in that, that space. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, great. Let's thank Alex again. Yeah. And our next talk is April 16th by Maria Inez de Frutos Fernandez.